really great brand. Uh, just a, a really awesome product, uh, a really good looking product, and uh, he's doing things a bit differently than you traditionally see from a lot of the breweries out there today. Um, in a world where 4,500 craft breweries are all fighting for attention, uh, specifically consumer, retailer, and wholesaler attention, and experimenting with a bunch of new styles and introducing thousands of new brands in the process, um, Chris has decided to take a different approach and focus exclusively on pale ales. Um, he doesn't chase trends, and uh, his company's year-round offerings include an American pale ale, a Belgian-style pale ale, a rye ale, and a session IPA. It's an intentionally simplistic approach to an incredibly confusing craft landscape that right now, at least, is plagued with a sort of flavor of the week brewing mentality. And what Chris misses being on sort of the bleeding edge of flavor exploration, he actually gains in an ability to focus on building a strong, recognizable brand identity that is designed to appeal to a more mainstream craft beer drinker. And it's an approach that doesn't come without its own set of challenges. Uh, the concept of maintaining an intense focus on a singular brand position, Pale Ales, uh, has led Chris to establish a core business philosophy of doing one thing and doing it right. Uh, that philosophy has permeated throughout his entire business, and Chris has structured his organization to focus on perfecting its efforts in four key areas, the beer, consumers, branding, and people. So what are his secrets? That's what he's here to share with you today. Chris Gallant, come on up. There's a clicker. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be here today. I've uh, been in the audience before, and um, it's, it's great to be up here to talk to you guys about my brand. We're, we're going to brew about 12,000, 13,000 barrels this year, so we're probably the smallest brewery to have been on this stage today. Um, so, it's, like I said, it's really exciting to share with you what we've done over the past six years in the Bronx. You know, we talk a lot about you know, focus, the Bronx Brewery. We have this slogan, do one thing and do it right. That's really only been around for the past year since our marketing team joined, but, um, but the whole ethos has been around for, for quite some time uh, since, we really, since we started. Uh, so what I want to do to you, uh, with you guys today is talk to you a little bit about what does this mean for us, so what does do one thing and do it right mean, and then talk to you about how do I apply it to all these different aspects of the business. Because it's not just about brewing you know, approachable pale ales, it's about you know, how do we find our consumer, how do we market to our consumer, and how do we excite our people. So do one thing, do it right. What does it mean? The first thing is authenticity. And so you guys are probably sick of hearing this word. Everyone has mentioned it today. It's, it's a huge buzzword, but I think it just underlies the importance of it. Every brand wants to be authentic, whether it's in beer, whether it's in candy bars, whatever it is. Um, you know, but for us, what this means is really loving your sense of place and loving what you make. And we are the Bronx Brewery. We brew on 136th Street in the Bronx. We're deeply integrated into the community. It's, it's so important to us. Um, and loving what we make. We don't make pale ales because it's a huge market opportunity. Uh, we'd be making IPAs if that was it. Um, we make pale ales because we, what we love to drink. My partner and I that started the company, this is the beer we were drinking for years before we started it. You know, the second thing that do one thing, do it right means for us is a singularity of vision. So our mission statement is to strive to make the best pale ales on the East Coast and to enliven the spirit of our community. So everything we do is really done in the context of that mission statement. Uh, the next thing is, is expertise. So this isn't about being the smartest guy in the room, it's, it's about building expertise. It's about learning from your mistakes, whether it's uh, you know, a beer launch that went bad, or whether it's my partner dropping a tank on me when we tried to install our brew house <laughs> and spending a night in the hospital. We, we try to learn from our mistakes. We only dropped one other tank. Um, and, and the next thing is, it's about execution. Uh, and this is something I think a lot of companies struggle with, us included. Great ideas are, are only the beginning. You've got to just, you can't just start something. You've got to see it through all the way to, to, to the end. And this is really a muscle that we spent six years building and we're still trying to build to this day. So focus, do one thing, do it right. And, and how do we apply this? Well, we apply it to the beers that we make, we apply it to the consumers that, that we make the beers for. We apply it to how we brand the beer and to our people. And so for the first year that, that we made beer, we made one beer. We made the American Pale Ale. This was a bit by design, right? We wanted to perfect this recipe. We wanted to, to make it as great as we could. 
It's a bit by force. We started out as, as a gypsy brewer. We didn't have much production capacity. And it was, it was a little bit by, you know, looking at the market and trying to understand what was going on out there. We were, you know, incredibly confused how, you know, all these new brewers that were coming out could have 8, 10, 12, 16 beers and make all of them really great. You know, we were just starting this company. And how, how can you make 16 really great beers, you know, in your first day? And how can you manage the business around this? How do you have the cash to buy all the raw materials? How can you manage to finish good inventory? So we made one beer for the first year. Um, and I think we got a lot of benefits from it. You know, it made our production process a lot easier. It made our sales process a lot easier. And I think most importantly, we were able to bring the freshest beer to market. You know, by you know, looking at your sales, pretty quickly you're able to plan your production around what you think the forecast will be and, and always make sure fresh beer in the market. So it's huge for us. And so after the first year, we wanted to expand a little bit, and we made seasonals. And it's really important for us to not expand too quickly, to do it methodically in terms of what our portfolio was. So two things. One, it was seasonal, so you're still only making two beers at a time, the American Pale Ale and one seasonal. And secondly, it's still within in our category, still within Pale Ale. So it's pretty easy for our consumer to understand, for them to make the leap from, hey, I've tried their, their American Pale. Now let me try their summer. It's a light pale ale with citrus. Or their spring. It's a pale ale with tea. And it wasn't until four or five years in that we actually started to expand our year-round portfolio once we had a bigger team that could really help us do that. We made some mistakes along the way. We released a black pale ale um, as one of our seasonals. Way too esoteric for our consumer. Now we still make it. It's in one of our limited series. But you know, we learned from that and said, hey, look, we, this is who drinks our beer. we got to make beer for them. So let's make our winter beer a pale ale with you know, nutmeg and some spices in it. So we're a consumer. So who is our consumer and how do we think about it? You know, I, you know, I ask a lot of craft brewers out there, who's your core consumer? How do you guys think about it? And normally I get one of two answers. I get anyone that drinks craft beer or all the way on the other end, you know, craft beer geeks and consumer and connoisseurs, or whatever iteration you want to use of that word. And I think neither of those really resonated with us you know, as, as business owners, as brewers, as people. Because the first one seems to be a little flawed because, you know, we talked a lot in all the presentations today about how the craft beer universe is getting bigger. And more and more drinkers are coming into the fold. Um, and as that universe gets bigger, the people that are in it are incredibly diverse. And so they're drinking craft beer for different reasons at different times in different places. And you can't be everything to everyone. So that didn't make sense to us. And then as we think about sort of craft beer geeks, uh, craft beer connoisseurs, this is a pretty valid segment. You know, our problem is that the beers we make, this isn't the beer they will always want to drink. Um, and also, there's 4,400 breweries, and a massive chunk of them are going after this, this one small segment. So as we took a step back and we started talking to some consumers out there, I think what we started to learn is that there, there's a big chunk of consumers that love beer, but they don't justify their existence by it. They're not always on untapped. Uh, there's a big segment of consumers that love to explore beers, but they always go back to their one, two, three standbys. And we said, look, this resonates with us. You know, how, how do we make beer and, you know, for these people and speak to these people? Um, and so you know, we took a look at you know, who's coming to our brewery. You know, this is uh, on one of our parties this summer. And these, these are what we call the straightforward beer lovers. These are the guys that are coming and they're drinking three summer pale ales, or they're drinking three of our session IPAs. You know, they're sitting down, well, this is actually our employees uh, in, a, in a, a canned photo shoot, but uh, this is generally who our consumers are. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the sort of environment, this is the sort of occasion that a lot of people are drinking our beer. And I think once we understand who they are, um, you start to understand when are they drinking. Now, uh, where are they drinking? And we start to really get our sales force and our sales strategy really zeroed in on that. And so you're going to see some of our beer, craft beer bars around the city. But really, the bulk of our beer is being sold at you know, Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, your local dive bar, your barbecue joint. And, and now that we understand this is where our consumers are going, we can make sure that our sales force is really focused on that stuff. The other thing that helps us understand you know, this concept of focus is branding. And uh, we did a shit job of this for the first four years until we hired a marketing team. We understood, you know, what our brand was in our head, right? We understood that we stood for something. We stood for being in the Bronx. We stood for making approachable pale ales. 
it was true, right? This, this is who we were. Um, we were super focused. But this is what's rattling around in our heads. And, and ultimately, what came across to the consumer was, man, these guys can only make pale ales. It wasn't until we got some really great people to help us with marketing that they helped us make this really simple and really clear for the customers. They turned it from, these guys can only make pale ales. So, whoa, these guys are only making pale ales. They're really experts in this stuff. Oops. And they communicated it effectively, right? So it's not just about coming up with this tagline, do one thing, do it right. It's not just about you know, creating some, uh, some really nice looking pictures like this one. It's about you know, getting it out into the market and really being on point every time. Now, this is from one of our uh, campaigns this, uh, earlier this year for our variety pack. You know, this is pretty much everything on message talking about how we make pale ales. And so the last place we really think about focus at the company is with our team, building our culture. I think it helps us in a, in a few key ways. The first is with hiring. You know, we, we have a pretty basic message now. We do one thing, we do it right, and we need to hire the people to do that. Um, you, know, we, you know, we have a lot of people. You put a sales position out there, I'm sure any brewery can do a test of it. You get hundreds of resumes, and you get a lot of people coming in. You ask them, you know, hey, what do you think it's going to be like to be a, a craft beer salesperson? They say, oh, man, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to do tap takeovers. I'm going to chill out. <laughs> All right. You're probably not our guy. Um, you know, we want someone that's, that's a little more focused, that understands this message of like, this is, this is who we're making beer for. So you've got to go into the crappy dive bar and explain to them why they're going to, why they're going to move a lot of our pale ale. And the second thing it helps us, is, helps us with is prioritization. And we're, we're pretty extreme with this, right? This year we came up with three major priorities for the company. We talked about moving off-premise, we talked about one of our seasonals, and we talked about a new beer that we're releasing later this year. And everything else kind of falls to the wayside. And there, there's a thousand decisions that happen during the, um, during the day at any brewery. A forklift breaks down, a tank falls on you, whatever it is. There's, there's a million things you've got to do, but you've got to bring all those decisions within the context of, of your priorities. And this is something we started doing this year. We didn't have it before. Um, and this, sort of, this concept of prioritization has really helped us make decisions. So, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z, and it's going to cost sort of 10,000 bucks. Well, is it, in the, if, is it within one of those priorities? And if it's not, then maybe we shouldn't do it because we're pretty small and we have limited funds. It also helps you know, all your employees you know, stay focused. So it helps them say, like, where do I need to sell? How do I need to market? Is it within these priorities? And, and the last point, we've mentioned this before, is, is having one vision. And so if you ask any of the guys that work at our brewery, they're going to tell you that we're about approachable pale ales and we're about the Bronx. They might have a little different way of saying it, every one of them, but everyone gets it. Everyone's on the same page and singing from the so same songbook. And so um, I'm trying to wrap this up quick because I know we're running pretty far behind, but um, I'm going to sit with Chris for a minute and, and do a little Q&A, but a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, for everyone. You know, first is you know, figure out, you got to figure out what your pale ale is. Uh, what is what's the thing that you're most passionate about and that sets you apart? Because you're not going to out local the next guy, especially when there's 40 breweries in New York City. You know, you're not going to out craft the next guy. So what, what really sets you apart? Uh, to focus everything around it. You know, there's, there's too many decisions that happen every day. You've really got to focus all your efforts or 80% of your efforts on, on your core. And three is make it exciting. Like, focus sounds boring, right? But if, if you can make it exciting for your team and you can and make it about you know, building a company and building something together, you can really get people on board. So that's it. Um, take some questions from Chris. Thank you guys for listening to me. For you too. By the way, if you guys have questions for Chris, uh, I'm still taking them up here on the iPad. Um, please feel free to shoot them up. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for, for joining us and, and telling us all about uh, your experience crafting a brand around pale ales. Um, why is this approach going to work? What's going to make it successful? Jeez, it's a tough question off the bat. <laughs> um, no, Sorry, I, we got limited time, yeah, right? No. So. Uh, you know, I think, I think we've seen some success, and I think it's important to think about where we haven't been successful, and I think like I mentioned the example of a black pale ale. Um, you know, our session IPA has been a tougher sell than we thought it would. And I think it's any time that we, we kind of stray from the strategy, it's, it's where 
um, we're not quite as successful. Anytime we double down on it, you double down on our summer pale ale or you know, we sort of understand where our consumers are, where they're drinking, and we push further on that, it's where you know, we really hit the accelerator. Is this approach, uh, do you feel it's helping to grow the category? The pale ale category? No, just, the, the, just the beer category. I mean, we talked a lot yeah. about you know, the, the fact that um, beer continues to lose share to, to wine and spirits, um, that it's about a share of the night out, and you're actively going after a more mainstream consumer set. So are you growing the category in this way? I'd, I'd like to think we are in, in our own small way. Um, you know, there, I think there's a lot of drinkers out there that, you know, for them, uh, you know, they've been drinking Heineken or they've been drinking Corona. They've been badging themselves with, with something that's, you know, really premium, really exciting, or, or maybe used to be really premium and really exciting. And now they want to get in on craft, um, but they don't necessarily love these really esoteric beers. So, you know, by creating something just for these people and, and helping them get in on the craft scene and helping them... Uh, get into and understand it and, and making something they like, we're hoping to grow the category, yes. Right. Um, do you feel that this approach is going to work as you scale? So 12,000 barrels, you said, this year. Uh, I guess first, you know, what are your aspirations for scaling the brand? And two, you know, when you get to the next level, um, will it always be pale ales or a focus on pale ales or will you have to pivot yourself and you know, we talked about that as well today yeah great question um, you know I think our aspirations are to be a larger regional craft brewery um, there's a lot of talk today about the difficulty in expanding nationally and so we don't really have our sights set on that yet but as we expand uh, you know to the other, re other regions we're certainly going to go with what our core is with our pale ales but as we try to grow, grow our base here in the city yeah i think we'll start to expand our repertoire a little bit we're not going to get too far away we have an ipa coming out um next week but it's it's going to start to expand a little okay and and you've gone a little bit away from pale ales with your b-side series correct we do we have a b-side series so i mentioned earlier 90 95 percent of our beer was was really pale ales but we have a second series uh, called the B-Side. It's a limited side series where we brew something different. It gives our brewers a chance to, to show you know, their interest in other things as well. Uh, gives consumers and really gives that craft beer geek that we talked about earlier a chance to try our stuff. They're not our core consumer, but we certainly want to talk to them as well. So th those are the brands that speak to the, to the, the connoisseur or the geek. Yeah, I, th I think it's, an, it's important to, to speak with them, even if it's not our focus. It's important, you know, they are the tastemakers in the industry. It's important to, uh, to have a, a line of communication with them. So that is our line of communication. Right. Um, as you look out into the space today, uh, what's one key area of the business that you think more craft breweries could improve upon? Oh, um, I think marketing. Um, and uh, my head of marketing is, I think, watching this live stream is, is going <laughs> to love that I said that. But uh, I, I think marketing is really the place where, where a lot of craft breweries need to, uh, to improve. The great beer is already out there. Uh, great salespeople are out there. Um, but I think as the space gets more and more crowded, people are going to need to understand how to differentiate their brand a lot more. Because, like I said, you can't out-local the next guy. You can't out-craft the next guy. Right. And what is great marketing for you guys? Uh, I think great marketing for us is, is about, you know, like we said, the concept of, of the brand itself and really trying to stand out, but it's also about great execution. So great marketing is, isn't just about coming up with a tagline, but it's about getting it in the market. So getting the POS in the market or sponsoring the right venue that aligns with your brand or you know, uh, you know, donating their beer to the right place. Right. And one thing that's helping you do that, I guess, is uh, your approach of taking on some of investment uh, from a bit of an earlier stage than most companies we've seen. You guys launched in, what, 2011? Um, and this was a deal that was announced with the family office last year. Um, so pretty quickly, or pretty early on, you realized, I need a financial partner in, in order to go out and do the things that I want to do. What's that experience been like? I think for us, it's been great. Um, Making beer and, and owning breweries is incredibly expensive. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, but, <laughs> I think uh, they do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it, no, it's been a really good experience for us. And, um, you know, we were, uh, we started by, you know, having friends and family invest. We've got over 50 friends and family invest in the company. And I think we reached a certain point where people were tapped out. 
Um, and so then we, we took on some bank debt, from a standard bank loan, uh, to, to build out the brewery in the Bronx. And, um, and at a certain point, you know, the banks want to stop lending to you, right? They need to see that you're cash flow positive. Um, and the banks aren't necessarily long-term investors, right? The banks are guys that need to start making their money back right away. And I think uh, Paul from Ulysses mentioned earlier about the long-term vision of, of family offices, which is the, the type of private equity vehicle that's invested in us. And so we needed someone with this much longer term horizon to say, yeah, you should go out and hire a head of marketing, a head of sales. You should expand the brewery and put in some more tanks. You should, you know, um, you know put more POS in the market and have that longer term uh, investment horizon. Are you going to be able to go back to them when you need more capital to expand? Or, you know, is it, is it going to be a situation where you have to go out and find another investor? I'd like to think that our partnership is strong enough for us to go back to them. Nice. Um, all right, so if you had to give one piece of advice to some folks in the audience today, uh, somebody who is either in your position, a similar size, or heck, you know, even some guys that are larger, what would it be? I guess it would be the topic of the presentation, do one thing and do it right. Um, you know, they, we haven't always done that, um, and I think when we strayed from that, it's when we, we sort of ran to our biggest mistakes, and uh, when we can't, sort of came back onto that track, it's, it's when things really grew. All right. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks.